you this evening. I'm Sean McDowell, your host, and I'm here with one of my favorite people, an apologist that you know, writer, New York Times bestselling writer. In fact, his story was the, the basis of a major motion picture. Lee Strobel, thank you for joining us. This is really a treat. Oh, I'm glad to be with you, Sean. I'm a big fan of yours and Viola's and your dad and so grateful for uh, all that you do. Well, we really appreciate you saying that. We have people streaming in already from all over the world. Awesome. And uh, let, let's jump in. And I, I thought it would be helpful if we uh, spent some time going into your story. And then once sure. we go into your story, we'll jump into some of the evidence for the resurrection why yeah. this matters and what hope it gives us for this week. So we're going to cover as much of that as we can. And we're going to take sure. some questions from people. I already see them posting some uh, live comments, which will be fun. Uh, but first, I just want to say, if this is the first time you're to this channel, make sure you hit subscribe because we have some other awesome interviews and videos that are coming up. We want to keep you abreast of everything going on in the world of apologetics. So Lee, let's start with your story. Many will know it from yeah. the movie, from the book, but if you could give us kind of the Reader's Digest version of your story with an emphasis on some of the facts of the resurrection that were most compelling to you. Sure. Uh, and by the way, the movie you mentioned is still free on Netflix. So um, if people haven't seen it, if they have Netflix, it's something they can watch for free. Everybody's uh, isolated these days and yes. look at something to watch. <laughs> well, you know, I was an atheist for much of my life. My background's in journalism and law. I was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, so I tend to be someone who responds to evidence, facts, logic, reason. Uh, my wife was agnostic. She was sort of spiritually confused, uh, as I was, but uh, not as hostile as I was. Mm. And uh, through the influence of a woman uh, who was a neighbor, who was a Christian and a nurse, uh, who Leslie got to know, uh, she ended up going to church with her and uh, several times, asked a lot of questions, and then she came home one day with the worst news I could ever get as an atheist. She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus. Wow. And honestly, the first word that went through my mind was divorce. I, I, uh, in fact, she had just planted a flower bed outside, and I had to go mow the lawn afterwards, and I went and I mowed down the whole flower bed. Are you serious? <laughs> I've never heard you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like to talk about it. It's, a, it's just an illustration of my passive aggressive uh, tendencies. But um, uh, so, <laughs> but I, I over the months, um, two things happened. I saw a lot of positive changes in her character and values, and and it was winsome and attractive, and kind of pulled me toward faith. But at the same time, I wanted the old Leslie back. Mm. You know, I wanted her old life back. So I thought, you know, if I could disprove Christianity. Um, I could rescue her from this cult that she got involved in. And so uh, I recognized immediately that the linchpin to Christianity is a resurrection. And I thought I should focus a lot of my attention on that. So I decided to take my legal training, my journalism training, and, and investigate whether or not there's credible evidence that Jesus rose from the dead or not. And so I ended up spending a year and nine months doing that. And okay. uh, really was surprised um, by the depth and the breadth of the evidence that I encountered. Um, and now it's become a lifelong study. Um, there's so much in recent years that's come out that's been helpful. But, um, you know, I, I know that Gary Habermas, who I interviewed for my book, The Case yeah. for Christ, yeah. of course, he's a famous uh, resurrection scholar. He used to use three words that begin with the letter E to summarize the evidence for the resurrection. I like to use four words okay. just to show just to show them up, you know. Just oh, of to, course, of course. <laughs> very, very petty of me, you know. But that's awesome. So um, I'll do it real quickly, and we can talk about any of this okay. uh, in depth if you'd like, or if people have questions. The first E is for execution; that Jesus was dead. There's no real dispute about that among scholars in the field. Okay. Even the Journal of the American Medical Association, which is a secular, scientific, peer-reviewed medical journal, uh, carried an investigation into the death of Jesus. And their conclusion was, quote, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Hmm. And uh, one of the reasons this isn't controversial is uh, one of the uh, some of the facts, a lot of the facts that we know from the ancient world, we know based on one or maybe two sources. Sure. And yet the death of Jesus, we not only have multiple early first century accounts in the documents of the New Testament, we've got five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his death. And so you can go to an atheist New Testament scholar like uh, Gerd Ludeman. 
And he'll tell you that the death of Jesus and the cross is historically indisputable. Hmm. So the first E is for execution. Jesus was dead. Second E is for early accounts. Okay. Uh, I used to think that the, the resurrection was a legend that took developed over a period of 100, 200 years after his life. But as Dr. Habermas has established, we have a account of the resurrection of Jesus that has named eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses that has been dated back by scholars to within months of his death. That's that is, a, it's a news flash from ancient history. I like to think of my journalism page. You know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's like a news flash of ancient history. We could talk more about how we know that later if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. The 30 is for the empty tomb, the word empty. And um, there's a lot of things we could talk about there, but I think the most persuasive evidence for the empty tomb is even the opponents of Jesus admitted it was empty. Uh, and we know that from sources inside and outside the New Testament, that when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now, think about that. That's a cover story. They're it implicitly is. admitting it the tomb's empty. They're just trying to explain how it got empty. Mm. So it's like if a student comes up to you, you're a teacher, and a student says, uh, the dog ate my homework. He's admitting, look, I don't have my homework, but I can explain what happened to it. The dog ate it. It's the same thing. So everybody, the enemies of Jesus, the supporters, are, are saying the same thing. The tomb was empty. And by the way, nobody believed the idea that the disciples stole the body. They didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. And they didn't have the opportunity. Mm. And then the fourth E stands for eyewitnesses. Gotcha. Um, and, and not only um, uh, uh, do we have the accounts. Um, well, let me put it this way. I said earlier, we're lucky in ancient history if we have one or two sources to confirm a fact. But for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Christ. Hmm. That is an avalanche of historical data. That's remarkable. So I spent two years investigating this stuff. And I remember it all came down. It was a Sunday afternoon. And um, I said to myself, you know, a good juror reaches a verdict. Hmm. The evidence is in after two years. I didn't think I was going to find out anything new at that point. So I sat down, I kind of reviewed everything, and then I sat back and I said, well, wait a minute. In light of this avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism wow. than to become a Christian. So it, it was like the, the scales went like that. Yeah. So I'm curious, when my dad describes his story, he set out to yeah. disprove Christianity, more of an agnostic than an atheist. He remembers yeah. being a, in a library in London, and it's like it clicked. He goes, yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. this is true. And he leaned back and kind of said out loud, like only my dad does to the entire library. <laughs> true. Do you remember, yeah. is there a moment or was it just a gradual kind of process for you? It, it was a gradual, it's a cumulative case. So it okay. was putting the bricks in place over these two years. But I remember the moment as clear as day. And you know what the last fact was that convinced me? And this is interesting because I know you've written on this and yeah. I think you did doctoral dissertation on this. But um, the last fact that really put me over the edge uh, was this. There are seven ancient sources, six of them outside the Bible, that confirm that the disciples lived lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of their proclamation that Jesus had risen. Now, how a few of them actually died gets a little lost in the midst of history. I'll grant you that. But sure. their sure. willingness to die, their willingness to suffer That's for their right. faith is I think, well-established by those seven sources. And my first thought was, yeah, so what? There have been religious fanatics throughout history that have died for what they believe. So what's the big deal? And then it hit me, the difference. If a terrorist today dies for his faith, crashing an airplane into a building or blowing himself up, why would he do that? Because he sincerely believes with all of his heart. Mm. If he dies this way, he'll go to paradise to be with his, his maker. Does he know for a fact? Well, no, but he's convinced. He believes it. He has faith in it. Well, that doesn't tell me anything about the truth of what he's saying. The contrast is of all human beings who've ever lived, the disciples were in a unique position. Mm. They there. They talked to him. They ate with them. They touched the resurrected Jesus. They, of all people, knew if this is true 
or whether it's a lie. And knowing it was true, they were willing to die for it. That I, that was the last that last. And then the scales, you know, your dad said a lot went, it was like the scales went like scales of justice kind of just went like that. And, and I realized, oh, my goodness, this is true. And it changes everything. Of all the times we've talked, Lee, and I've heard you speak and seen the movie, I've never heard you cite that piece of evidence that yeah. kind of pushed it over. And I appreciate that you nuance it because there's a temptation among yeah. Christians to overstate how they all died. But really, yeah. that just shows their willingness. They're not liars. They're not yeah. making this up. If you and I die for our faith, at best, people would say, hey, Lee and Sean, they're apologists. They really believed it. But our testimony yeah. doesn't mean anything evidentially. But they were right. there. They saw, exactly. they touched, they heard. By the way, we have people coming in from all over the world. Uh, Alberta, yeah. Canada, people are chiming in from uh, fellows watching from India, even all oh. the way in Texas, Lee, where you oh. are that far. People are streaming in. So there's some hey, great John, John, did did you hear that the other day someone saw God here in Texas? <laughs> and and they, so? asked, they, they asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm working from home. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Only in Texas. Well, I can appreciate that Dad because I was born it. in Texas. I've got it, got it in my blood. Well, let I want to come back to some of the evidence, and we're going to take sure. some questions that we have yeah. here coming up in a minute. But yeah. first, I'm wondering. I heard some things earlier this week where people said this could be the hardest week for America and some other countries with the yeah. virus that's spreading. Right. And it hit me. I thought, you know what? This is also Easter week, which was the hardest mm -hmm. week for the disciples of Jesus. And yet yeah. there's a message of the resurrection that comes out of this. So what yes. message of hope would you give to people in kind of the craziness that we just find ourselves in right now and the stress financially, emotionally, spiritually? How does the resurrection speak to that? Well, it's a, it's a great question. One of the things we all need in the midst of this pandemic, and, and my own brother uh, died last month from the flu. Oh. Um, uh, we don't know if it was uh, COVID-19 because he died right at the beginning of the pandemic. There was no testing at that point, but he had just come out of surgery. He was weak. He caught the flu and he died. We've had three people in our neighborhood die. Three? Uh, wow. 19, yeah, at a nursing home nearby. So, you know, we're all looking for hope. We're all looking for hope. But there's different kinds of hope. Um, you know, there's blind optimism. There's uh, wishful thinking. There's I'm going to cross my fingers and just hope, hope, hope that is true kind of hope. Um, but that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope, as I see it, is the confident expectation that God is willing and able to fulfill the promises he's made to us. Mm. And I think it's interesting. I got my Bible here and I just want to read a verse or two from uh, first Peter, the first chapter. Great. It says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So the Bible is explicitly linking this living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why you're right. This week is especially um, relevant to this issue of what do we do in the midst of a pandemic like this? Where do we find hope? We find living hope. Jesus, you know, Jesus, one of the things I love about, I love a lot about Jesus, but <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> well, one of the things I love the most is he told the truth. You know, okay. there are other religious leaders who will call suffering Maya. It's illusion. You know, it's not, it's an illusion. Hey, my brother's death is not an illusion. Um, Jesus was honest. He said, um, he said to his disciples in uh, John 16, verse 33, he said, I'm telling you these things so that you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, wow. but take courage. I have overcome the world. And those are the two very things we need in the midst of the pandemic. We need peace for the present and courage for the future. Amen. Uh, and it's linked to the resurrection of Jesus. Because Easter is true, there is hope. If Easter is a lie, there is no hope. Lee, we're going to jump into the evidence, but I do have one more for you because I see yeah. comments from Australia, from all over, and one in uh, Southern California. His name is yeah. Logan, and he says, do you ever doubt your faith? Hmm. You know, I get questions that come to my mind uh, that bug me. There are things I still wonder about. Um, 
And, you know, I think someday in heaven, I'll have my hand up and say, hey, Jesus, what about, how does this Calvinism <laughs> thing work with, with uh, Arminianism? And, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll be asking all kinds of questions. But here's the thing that um, kind of rules my thinking. You don't have to know everything to know something. What I can know confidently is that Jesus not only claimed to be the son of God, but he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. Mm. And so I always come back to that. It is okay in light of that to hold some peripheral questions in tension and say, I may never get an answer to certain things, Mm. but I can ask God in heaven someday. It doesn't change the fundamental truth, the key truth, this foundation of our faith, this anchor, the Bible calls it, of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. So when I get a question, Mm. I go to people like you. (laughs) I go to people I trust who are scholars, who are experts. My son is a PhD. I go to him. I try to research both sides of it and all sides of it and try to come to a resolution. But I I, I feel okay in the fact I don't have to know everything in order to know something. And what I know, I know with confidence. That's a great way to put it because I think so many people get paralyzed thinking that knowledge requires certainty. Right. But in life, you're saying we have good reasons to believe something and right. we know it. We don't have yeah. to have all our ducks in a row, so to speak. That's yeah. a great way, great way to think about it. Let's apply that to the resurrection. Yeah. And I'm curious because you became a believer in the 80s. So you've been studying this stuff for a long time. From your right. perspective, how has the evidence in particular for the resurrection changed since what was available or the arguments that were made four decades ago or so? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, because back then, there wasn't much available. Hmm. I mean, I read all the atheist literature I could find. I read Bertrand Russell. I read Anthony Flew, who wrote The Presumption of Atheism. And uh, I I read as many uh, books on the Christian side as I could find. There wasn't a lot back then. There was Norm Geisler had written a book. Your dad had begun to write some books. Um, One of the books I read back then was called Who Moved the Stone? Yes, a Morrison. Frank Morrison, and and, uh, he investigated the resurrection and became a believer. And um, so the evidence, basic evidence was there, but I'll tell you the key. Um, And this has only emerged, uh, I think, since the mid 80s, if I'm not mistaken, or at least it was, it's certainly been perfected, this argument since then. And that is um, the, um, the understanding that 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3, is a creed, a creedal statement of the earliest Christians right there in the first century. And that Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, he wrote it 21 to 25 years after the death of Jesus. And he includes this creed. And this creed is Uh, says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses to whom he appeared, including his half-brother James, who was a skeptic during Jesus' lifetime. And then Paul at the end says, and he appeared to me also. And Paul, of course, was an opponent of Christianity. But here's the deal. Um, Paul indicates in this letter to the Corinthians that he'd already given him this creed on an earlier visit. So let's date it within, say, 20 years of the death of Jesus, because Jesus died in 30 or 33 A.D. Yep. Now, we could stop there, and that would be persuasive. And back then, as I was reading this, I thought, wow, 1 Corinthians has this early statement about eyewitness account and so forth, including 500 witnesses at once. Pretty good stuff. But people have since pointed out, and and Dr. Gary Habermas has pointed this out and and others, that um, we can date it back earlier. Because we know that Paul used to be Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of Christians. One to three years after the death of Jesus, he's on the road to Damascus. Boom, he has this encounter with the risen Christ. He becomes the apostle Paul. Immediately, he goes into Damascus to meet with some apostles. Now, there are a lot of scholars who say this is when he was given this creed that he later writes in the letter. Mm -hmm. But others are a little more skeptical. They say, no, it may have been three years later. Three years later, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He meets for 15 days with two eyewitnesses who are specifically named in the creed, Peter and James. And and, and the Greek word that Paul uses in Galatians to describe this meeting indicates that this was an investigative inquiry. They're checking each other out. What do you know? What did you see? And and, and so um, some people say this is when he was given the creed by two people specifically named in the creed. But either way. 
This means within one to six years after the death of Jesus, this creed is already in existence. Therefore, the beliefs that make up that creed go back even earlier, virtually to the cross itself. In fact, one of the greatest scholars in this area is James D.G. Dunn. And this is a quote from his. He said, this tradition, by that he means this creed, this tradition, we can be entirely certain, wow. was formulated as a tradition within months of the death wow. of Jesus. That is historical gold. Yeah. And, and that has been crystallized uh, more in recent years. And, and for many people, it is the it, it is the key to um, them concluding that that this is really true. That's not the only early report sure, we got. Sure. We got others in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Book of Acts, and so forth. But um, that is a fabulous piece of it. In fact, uh, one last thing about it. I get excited <laughs> when I talk about it. But um, one of the few Jewish New Testament scholars, Pinchas Lapid, said the historical credentials of that creed are so impressive that it can be taken as a statement of eyewitnesses. That's, that's stunning. Good. That's yeah. stunning. Lee, I think that's that's pretty remarkable because when you look and put that in context of other figures like Alexander the Great or yeah. Buddha, we're talking yeah. biographies three, four hundred years removed. We have yeah, all, when you look at yeah, Alexander it, the Great, the first two biographies by by Arian and Plutarch written four hundred years after his life, and they're right. generally accepted. So, so, so we have four biographies within the century Jesus lived. But 1 yeah. Corinthians 15 was written within 25 years, and that small yeah. creedal statement is probably within that one to six year window, so to speak. Right. Historically exactly. speaking, that's stunning. I teach a class at Biola on the evidence for the resurrection, and we go through the book by Mike Lacona, and we go through yeah. the book by N.T. Wright. And at the end, a lot of them say that fact is one of the most convincing Yes. To them. Well, we're going to come back to the evidence, but I see a great question from Megan here. And I know you'll yeah. love this one, Lee, because you have an evangelist heart. <laughs> how would you suggest pursuing resurrection conversations this Easter mm. at a distance, separated from family and friends? Will yeah. the believer's witness be quarantined, so to yeah. speak? That's a great. I just gave a sermon on that topic this okay. last week at our church. And uh, so I'll summarize it very quickly. But I think there are some ways that we can reach out. One of them is very simple. And to send an email to your friends, because we're all socially isolated, or call them up and, and, and say, I know you're probably going stir crazy. Uh, you're probably looking for something to watch on TV. Can I make a suggestion? It's Easter. Um, it, there's a movie. It's free on Netflix. And it's called The Case for Christ. Right. And I was just listening to a guy the other day yeah. who... Which the movie's about, and um, he was a skeptic, and he investigated the evidence and became a Christian. Would you be interested in what convinced him? But it's a movie with an Academy Award-winning actress and with Academy Award-nominated uh, actors. Um, I think you'll enjoy it because this movie uh, has the gospel in it. I met a pastor in Des Moines, and he said, my personal ministry is when I meet someone who's not a Christian— I invite him over to my house to watch the movie The Case for Christ with me. I said, really? What's the result been? He said, 37 people have come to faith in Christ. Wow. 37. Wow. Well, there was a, a, a little church in New Zealand, and they rented a movie theater, and they showed the movie, and 22 people came to faith. That's so incredible. there's something. We're all looking for movies to watch these days. You get tired of watching all the junk. And, and so if you can you know, suggest that that might be helpful to someone or entertaining because it isn't entertaining and let them know that uh, even though a lot of Christian films are kind of cheesy, this movie got an A plus rating from CinemaScore, which is a secular rating service. So it, it's, it's really not amazing. it's not cheesy at all. I watched it with my family. I kind of made my kids sit down. I had to play the dad card, but they're like, Dad, it's. <laughs> It's really good. And actually, I wrote up a little discussion guide that I'll send you and I'll tweet it out for families to ask. And I posted a while ago. I'll repost that. But that is such, awesome. such a good idea. It's a kind of movie Christians can be proud of because you tell the gospel, but it's a natural part of your story. It's yes. not forced. So, Megan, that's one thing all of us can do. That I think yeah. Is great. Go, go ahead. I think you wanted to say something. No, I, I was just going to say there's a, there's a scene in the movie that um, I was just kind of thinking about the other day. And um, it's when um, I was interviewing in, in real life and the movie is uh, kind of plays in a different context, but it's still accurate. Um, I was interviewing Dr. Alexander Metherell, who's a scholar on the resurrection, a medical doctor and an yep. engineer, PhD. 
And after he went through the description of the horrible torture of crucifixion and what Jesus endured um, to die uh, on the cross, and, and I remember asking him, I don't get, why would he do that? He didn't defend himself. He didn't, um, he stayed silent. He, he didn't try to get out of it. Um, why would he willingly allow himself to be tortured like that? And he thought for a moment and he said, well, I think it can be summed up in one word and that would be love. Wow. And that's always stuck with me. Mm-hmm. That's, always, that's what Easter is about. That's what Good Friday is about. It's about love, that God so loved the world. He sent his son to die as our substitute to pay for all of our sin so that forgiveness and eternal life can be offered as a free gift. And that's just, it's always haunted me. It's, uh, it's that one word, it's love. That's, that's beautiful, and that does capture the gospel. Um, yeah. We're going to jump back into the evidence and take some questions sure. here, but you know I'm a superhero guy and actually have on a uh, Biola Spider-Man shirt. Interestingly <laughs> enough, they, they made them for a season, which was kind of fun. But I, I, I mention that because in the 10-year the movie that, that Marvel made, the cinematic universe, you have Infinity War and then you have Endgame. And the end game climax. Sorry if somebody hasn't seen it. I'm going to ruin it. You've had plenty of time. One, plenty I of time. One superhero movie. <laughs> the, the movie about Infinity War is like, what would you sacrifice a human life for? Oh. And what, what Captain America says, we're not in the business of exchanging lives until the only way to save the universe is for somebody mm-hmm. to willingly lay down their life. In the Marvel universe, that's Iron Man. He's the hero. Because he willingly laid down his life for others. I'm watching that going, this is the gospel. It's yeah. love and it's beautiful. Yet, of course, yeah. in the Mar- Marvel Cinematic Universe, Iron Man is gone. In <laughs> real life, Jesus comes back. And that's a part of the beauty, I think, of the resurrection. Well, let me, let me ask you a question in particular. I think yeah. I've told you this, Lee. I had a real period of doubt in my life. I was about 19 years yeah. old. This was in the mid-90s. And it was the first time people could kind of Google and find, or actually you couldn't Google yet, but you could search and find these blogs. And there were all these blogs responding to my dad's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And I'd yeah. never heard this before and it really unsettled me. And mm. I remember thinking, my dad means well, but what if he's wrong about this? And one of the arguments that was made, you deal with in your book, uh, the case for the real Jesus. Yeah. Namely, this was one of the biggest arguments that unsettled me for season, was this idea that there's these other dying and rising gods of the ancient yeah. world that Christianity is just patterned after. To, yeah. after. So let me play the skeptic here and you play the other side. Yeah. Uh, what about all these other people that have died and risen from the grave? Doesn't that discount the Christian story? Yeah, and, and that, you know, that is the kind of argument, um, respectfully to those who make it, that historians laugh at. And uh, the reason is um, you could go to TND Medinger, who is a senior Swedish scholar who's written a book, um, a scholarly treatise on this topic. And his conclusion is there are no cases of dying and rising gods that predated Christianity. And then he says, but having said that, I'm going to stretch and say, maybe these five will look at. And he looks at those five and says, none of them have any parallels to the story Mm. of Jesus. You know, the one that's commonly mentioned is Mithras. And um, you remember the Da Vinci Code talked about. Yes, yes. People would say, well, what about Mithras? He was born of a virgin. He had 12 uh, disciples. He died for world peace. He was resurrected from the dead. What about all that? And, and you go, wow, that's that's impressive until you research and you find, number one, he wasn't born of a virgin. He emerged fully grown from a rock. So unless the rock was a virgin, then <laughs> right, that barrel right. no good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, he didn't. He didn't. Um, there, there's no um, story in mythology about Mithras dying, and so there's no resurrection as well. And he didn't, by the way, um, lay down his life for human peace or whatever. He, he's known for killing a bull. And you, you can just go down the list of of these parallels, and they just evaporate when they're fully investigated. So in my book, uh, The Case of the Real Jesus, which you've now renamed, it's now called In Defense of Jesus, um, I interviewed Dr. Michael Lacona, who you cited earlier, who's a yep. resurrection 
and scholar with a PhD from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And um, he just he just shoots that down uh, very easily. It's it's just not a, a uh, the, the dying and rising God thing. It can be made so it sounds so impressive. Um, but, you know, once you look into it, it just evaporates. And by the way, Mithras um, apparently stole its ideas from Christianity later anyway, uh, after Christianity. So, One of the things for me that when I started to look into this, I found is that the same terminology is used. Yes. But it means very, very different things. Like Exactly. I, I haven't looked on Wikipedia in a while, but last I looked, it described the resurrection of Osiris and how yeah. he became a god. Well, you study the story further, and he's murdered, he's thrown to the ocean, his body's put back together, and he becomes god of the underworld. I'm thinking this isn't even close to a resurrection. Right, so exactly. This, so, let and, you know, the story of Mithras, you know, they, they'll use words, Christian words, like uh, baptism. Oh, they have baptism. Well, wait a minute, what did they do? Uh, a new convert to Mithraism was put in a pit and a bull, a dead bull, was put over them, suspended, and they would slit it open, and all the blood would come down uh, on, on the new convert. Is that a parallel to Christian baptism? I don't think so. So often, you're right, they will use Christian terminology to make it sound like there's a parallel when, when there really isn't one, like Osiris in the question of resurrection. That's not a resurrection no. in any sense of the word. Well, I'm going to jump back to the evidence, but here's a question from Paul that I think is really interesting. He says, yeah. should Easter be more about Jesus dying or that he was able to rise from the dead or a little bit of both? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you have to look at Holy Week with glasses that have two lenses. And okay. one lens keeps a focus on Good Friday, the, the death of Jesus Christ in payment for our sins. If Jesus had not died uh, as our substitute to pay for all the sins we've ever committed, uh, he would not be able to offer forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift of his grace. And so, you know, we, we've, we've got to see through that lens and recognize the importance uh, of Good Friday. But then uh, through this other lens, we keep that focused on the resurrection where Jesus is victorious mm. over death. Mm. And, and as I said in, in John 16, 33 later, I have overcome the world. He's overcome the grave. And because of that, we can be confident of his promise that those who follow him will someday overcome the grave as well. Mm. So they're both important. And I think it's important to keep the glasses on that have two lenses to pay attention to both of these aspects of Holy Week. Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but did Case for Christ first come out in 1998 in the late 90s? Is that right? Yes. When I read it, a number of things stood out to me. I love the chapter describing the death of Jesus with mm. Alexander Methrell. That was eye-opening. But the interview with J.P. Moreland, who I now teach with at yep. Biola, he gives the example of asking the question, why do we call it Good Friday? Yeah. Like, isn't it bizarre that in just a few days is Good Friday, yet on Good Friday, this is when our Lord and Savior was murdered and tortured? Like, talk yeah. about how bizarre that is and why that is significant. In a sense, kind of a piece of evidence that Jesus was really put to death. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly the um, uh, in the first century, uh, followers of Jesus never would have invented the story that he was crucified. That was a, an abhorrent death. That was an embarrassment. Um, my goodness, that's the worst possible thing that can happen to someone. And, and they would never invent that. So you're right. It, it is uh, evidentiary to, uh, in the fact that um, it, it, the criterion of embarrassment would tell us that this is an embarrassing fact mm. that they would never have reported unless it was actually true. Um, but, you know, I know that you can look at the uh, origin of the term Good Friday, and a lot of people say it, it comes from Gott's Friday, which was German for God's Friday. But because um, you think about it, who is it good for? It wasn't good for Jesus, um, you know, uh, and yet um, I, I think of the words of Joseph in Genesis 50, verse 20, um, where he said uh, to his brothers, uh, what you intended for harm, God used for good. And um, what Satan intended for harm, what the world intended for harm in terms of killing the Son of God, God used for good. And, I, and that is good. And, and one of the things that tells me is this. 
in the midst of this pandemic, as so many of us are suffering, I think of the death of my own brother in this. Mm. And um, so many people have lost their jobs. So many people are uh, going to lose their businesses. Um, uh, it's really a tragedy in many ways. And I think a lot of people are saying to themselves, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Romans 8.28 says, if we're followers of Christ, God can cause all things to work together for good. There's no way he can take what has happened to me and turn it for good. Mm. And what I say to that is, wait a minute. If God can take the worst thing that could ever happen in the history of the universe, which is the death of the Son of God on the cross, and turn it into the best thing that's ever happened in the universe, which is the... Um, um, opening of heaven to all who follow him, can't he take our circumstances, as bad as they seem to be at the moment, and draw good from them if we follow him? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 that comes to my mind a lot um, as we go through life and we have tragedies face us. God can take the worst thing and turn it into the best thing. He can take the circumstances of our life and draw good from them in this world or the next. That's beautiful and important truth, especially in this season to remember. By the way, I didn't tell you that quite a few people made comments just showing condolences for your brother and your neighbors. Appreciate I'm sorry that. they went through that. Here's an interesting question from Bo, and then I'm going to jump back in the evidence for the resurrection. Yeah. Um, from Southern California, he says, how are we to know when God is speaking to us? Mm. I'm ready to listen, but I don't know when he is speaking to me. That's a great question. I think what I'd say to that is a couple things. Number one, um, God mainly speaks to us through his word, through the Bible. That's the main way in which God communicates to us. Um, somebody once said, um, um, don't, tell, uh, don't tell me that God isn't speaking to you if your Bible is closed. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. That if, uh, you know, th that is the main source of how God speaks to us. Um, now, there are times when we get the Holy Spirit brings an impression into our spirit and, and we, um, we sense God uh, um, uh, pointing us in a direction. I've had many times in my life where I prayed and asked God for guidance and wisdom and how um, I felt that. I felt his affirmation of going a certain path and his displeasure in other paths. And so I think there is that supernatural sense in which we sense God guiding us and leading us. Um, I almost think, though, that it, it's it's more trustworthy when those urgings or leadings that we think we're getting seem to be counter to what we would expect mm. or that we would want. OK, I remember after I became a Christian, uh, I was at the Chicago Tribune. I was at the height of my career at the Chicago Tribune. I'd written my first book. I was doing television shows, um, loved what I was doing. I was on the front lines of history at one of the, at the greatest newspaper between the coasts. And um, I began to sense that God was leading me out of that to take a 60% pay cut wow. and, and to join the staff of a, of a church. Okay. Now, that, that was not a <laughs> that's not something I wanted to do in a lot of ways. It's like, seriously, sure. really? I'm going to live on that. And, um, and and a lot of Christians I went to and said, what do you think? They said, how are you going to put your kids through school? I mean, let's be practical here. But you know what? It was an atheist that encouraged me. Very it was my interesting. father. My father-in-law was an atheist. And he wow. said, Lee, if you really believe that that's what you should do, then you should do it. Wow. And I thought it interesting that an atheist would say that. By the way, he came to faith on his deathbed. I remember you but, hearing that story. That's unbelievable. Uh, That's unbelievable. But anyway, I think if it runs contrary to your self-interest in a lot of ways, I give it a little more credence okay. that um, if we're not reading into what we think God wants us okay. to do. By the way, Lee, there's a comment here that says, I'm a Christian. One of the biggest reasons I converted was because of your movie. So, again. Oh, wow. Awesome. An encouragement for those watching to go watch Case for Christ and share it with others, especially during the season. It feels natural. Seize the day. Well, let me yeah. jump back. You've written a whole book on you know, this. Uh, excuse me, Sean, before you yeah. do that, one last thing about the how do I know God speaking to me okay. kind of a thing. Always um, uh, there's there's counsel, the good counsel in a multitude of brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, always seek out 
godly men and women in your life who you can speak honestly to and say, this is what I'm feeling God is leading me to do. What's your input? Let's pray about it together. The Holy Spirit is consistent. And so when I prayed and felt God was leading me out of my career to give it all up and to go in this other direction, I told Leslie and she prayed about it too. And guess what? She had the same leading. And God, the Holy Spirit's consistent. So make sure godly men and women that you consult with and and, uh, before you do anything. That's great advice. Thanks for throwing that in there. You, You wrote a book recently after the case for Christ called The Case for Miracles. Yeah. Well, as we talk about the evidence for the resurrection, Clearly, it's a miracle. And there's a lot of people today that will dismiss the evidence before they even start because there must be some scientific or natural explanation. In a sense, we call this methodological naturalism, but it's really a bias whether people can name it or not against the miraculous. So why do you believe that miracles happened in the past and frankly still happen today? What's the evidence for the miraculous? Yeah, I think there's a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. They think that miracles are impossible. Miracles never happen because they violate the laws of nature. And you can't violate the laws of nature. But I remember J.P. Moreland, your buddy, and he mentored my son, uh, Kyle, as well, um, told me a story once. He said, you know, um, uh, and I'm going to change the story a little bit because I'm holding my cell phone right now. <laughs> and he, he said, basically, if, if I drop this cell phone, and it hits, if I drop the cell phone, the law of gravity tells me it's going to hit the ground. But if I drop this cell phone and you reach in and grab it before it hits the ground, you haven't violated the laws of gravity. You've not overturned the law of gravity. You've merely intervened. And if there is good evidence, which I believe there is from cosmology, physics, biochemistry, and genetics, that there is a supernatural creator, then of course he can intervene Uh, in the creation that he brought into being and the laws that he himself created. Of course, he can intervene. That's not a stretch for him. This God who created the entire universe, you know, walking on water, turning water into wine or a virgin birth or a resurrection is like child's play. So I think part of it for me is, do we have credible evidence that there is a supernatural creator? And in my book, The Case for Miracles, I do several chapters on the evidence. Well, I have two in particular with a PhD uh, from UCLA, who's a professor at a secular, major secular university, University of Oklahoma, who um, describes the evidence from physics and cosmology that I think points powerfully and persuasively toward the conclusion that there is a creator. And if that is true, then miracles are child's play for him. And it becomes more easy for us to accept that. That's a great great way to think about it. You, you may be aware of this. I haven't seen you in this time period, but in the past six months, I have a student who's doing a documentary on miracle claims. And like oh. you, he's going to have, I think, William Lane Craig, Michael Shermer on the other side. And he has sent me to peer-reviewed journal articles in medical yes. journal articles. Yes. Yes. One of a stomach, somebody that was healed through prayer. Yes, that was recent. And somebody legally blind that was probably four or six weeks ago. Yep. These kind of cases are popping up in the present in That's a way right. we're documenting that is really, really powerful. But I know you also have in the book. Right now, there's probably a lot of people praying for their loved ones. Yeah. And not everybody we pray for necessarily gets healed. Yeah. What do you say? You believe the resurrection happened. Believe yep. miracles happened today. But what about when God doesn't intervene and doesn't do miracles? What would you say in those cases? I knew I couldn't write a book on miracles without addressing that question. Um, What about miracles that don't happen? And so I went to a a man, a a scholar, who was qualified to talk about this on two levels. First of all, he's a brilliant scholar, uh, Dr. Douglas Groteis of Denver Seminary. He's written a 714-page book on the evidence for the Christian faith. So he has it all up here. But at the time, his wife was dying of a rare condition. She was losing her mind. Uh, her mind was deteriorating. It was a kind of a form of dementia. And indeed, she did die after my interview with him came out in my book. Um, and so he had prayed, obviously, for her healing. And it didn't come. And uh, so I sat him down and interviewed him. And I'm telling you, Sean, I've interviewed a lot of people in my life. It was one of the most powerful conversations I have ever had. And I just urge anybody, you don't have to buy my book, go to the local library and check it out. If this, if this is an issue for you, read that chapter with Douglas Groteis. 
um, and because he talks from his his heart as well as his head. And I'll give you the nub of it. You know, God is sovereign. God sees things and understands things that we cannot. And, uh, you know, miracles were not automatic in the New Testament either. Um, uh, Paul didn't heal everybody. Uh, Trophimus was sick, and Paul goes off on a missionary journey. He doesn't heal Trophimus. Um, um, in Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are given the authority to heal, and then seven chapters later, they fail to heal an epileptic boy. Mm-hmm. Um so miracles were not, are not automatic one way or the other. Um, so we have to understand that God under, we see things through a glass darkly. We don't understand things that God understands. He has the big picture. And as we trust in him, hmm. you know, we throw around as Christians, like it's some cliche, Romans eight twenty eight says, God will cause all things to work together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And we throw that around, but this is from the word of God. And one way or the other, in this world or the next world, God will take hmm. these circumstances in our life and use them for our ultimate good. Um, so, you know, it's a tough issue. It's And, and you know, um, once I interviewed uh, Dr. Peter Kraft, uh, who's a famous uh, philosopher at, in Boston uh, College, and uh, he, on the pain and suffering question, why does God allow pain and suffering? Why doesn't he heal everybody? Why doesn't he always do the miracle? Yeah. And he said, you know, um, there are about 20 lines of evidence that point toward the truth of Christianity. Wow. Cosmology, wow. physics, biochemistry, genetics, human consciousness, origin of life, the resurrection, all of these things that point toward the truth. And on the other side of the scale, you basically have the pain and suffering issue. Um mm. He said it, it doesn't counteract wow. all of this other evidence. Wow. That's not to diminish it, but often it's not asked by someone who just wants an intellectual answer. W- w- often when I get in a conversation with someone who's not a Christian, I'll ask them this question. If you could ask God any one question and you knew he'd give you an answer right now, what would you ask him? 80% right. of the time. I get an answer, something to do with why does God allow pain and suffering? But I don't answer the question. I ask him a follow-up question. The follow-up question is, wow, of all the potential questions in the universe, why did you ask that one? And now we get down to the real issues. I'm asking it. I want to know the answer because my brother died of the flu last month. Or I want to know because... My wife and I lost a child in childbirth five years ago, and I want to know where was God. Now we get to the heart issue. And you know what? A lot of people with these heart issues, they're not looking for a five-point sermon on why God allows pain and suffering. I could do that. I've done that. But they want me to put my arm around their shoulder, and they want me to walk through this tragedy with them and love them in the midst of it. I think that's the truth. That interview with Grotice is powerful. We we interviewed him on the Think Biblically podcast, and here's a razor sharp, yeah. intellectual, brilliant philosopher, and who really suffered personally. So it's not an academic issue for him. And I yes. remember he said the line between despair was he had to resist the idea that he knew better than God. Yes, if he could keep that issue at bay he could deal with the suffering. And I just thought that's something I'll never forget. That's excellent. You know, he wrote a book after I interviewed him for my book. I said to him, Doug, you need to write a book. And he wrote a book that I consider to be a masterpiece. And it's called Walking Through Twilight. A great book. Oh, my goodness. I just think it is fantastic. And I recommend it to so many people. If you know someone who's going through this kind of thing, what a gift to be able to give them. Here's a question that comes yeah. from a, a apology, I believe, is a, a skeptic. It says, consider a notion Peter and Paul were the only actual eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. Our gospels and creeds would then be legendary. Do other lines of evidence contradict such a scenario? So I think he's saying, imagine it's just Peter and Paul were the only eyewitnesses, and then that would mean that the gospels themselves are legendary. Are there other lines of evidence that would contradict such a notion? Well, I'm not sure I grasp the whole question, but, um, um, you know, when, when we talk about eyewitnesses, um, we have nine lines of evidence from ancient history uh, that 
corroborate the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Um, you know, we, we have, for instance, the creed, which talks about James, the half brother of Jesus, um, and also the 12. Uh, so there's a, you know, I don't know why you wouldn't consider that to be strong historical data. Um, it's not just Paul and it's not just uh, Peter. Um, we have people outside the Bible, Clement, who was um, uh, ordained by Peter himself, who sat under the teachings of some of the disciples, and they report um, in letters. And right, right in the first century, he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church um, so talking about the confidence the disciples had because of the resurrection. And then Polycarp, who was uh, appointed Bishop of Smyrna by John, um, he sat under the teachings of the, he certainly knew John. Yeah, he, he did. He, he sat under their teachings, the apostles, many of them anyway. And he report, he, he wrote a letter to the Philippians in which he mentions the resurrection no fewer than five times. And, and he says they had confidence because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have people who, who listened and, and learned from the apostles themselves. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, that. I mean, I'll go through the nine sources, but you have sure. the creed, you have the creed that, that Pinchus Lapid, the Jewish scholar, said yep. is to be statement, taken as a statement of eyewitnesses. You have Paul, who himself was an eyewitness to the res- risen Christ, who says in 1 Corinthians 15, 11, whether it's I or they, this is what we preach, talking about the disciples. He confirmed that they believe the same thing. We have Peter in Acts. Um, scholars, even skeptical scholars, will accept Acts as being uh, having summaries of the preaching of the early church. And he gets up right there in Jerusalem a few weeks after the resurrection and says um, uh, that God raised this Jesus to which we're all eyewitnesses. Um, uh, number four, five, six, and seven are the Gospels. And I think we have good reason to believe that the Gospels tell us the truth about the essential teachings, life, miracles, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then we have, at a minimum, Polycarp and Clement um, from sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating what the disciples tell them. That's nine sources of information. I think that is a pretty good um, um, uh, collection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I would say even if it was just Peter and Paul, I think we have reason to trust Paul's testimony internally, his willingness to suffer and die, I think Peter. Yeah. But we don't. We have additional evidence. So for me, I don't find any compelling reason to think that this story is legendary. But let me ask you this one. We have we have, we have, have a few minutes left. Yeah. Perhaps the most common objection to the resurrection is that the apostles had hallucinations. Yeah. And I know you deal with that in your book. But in academic circles, not necessarily popular circles, yeah. that's probably the most common explanation to yeah. uh, discount it. What would be your response to the idea they had hallucinations and didn't actually yeah. see Jesus? Yeah, it could be hallucinations or visions of some sort. Um, I'm a journalist, so I check things out. So when I had that objection, I went to a scholar who has a PhD. He understands the human mind. He has a PhD in psychology. He was a professor of psychology for 20 years at a major Midwestern university. He'd written over 20 books on psychology. He was the president of a national association of psychologists and counselors. So this guy knew his stuff. And I laid out all the evidence. I said, now, Dr. Collins, wouldn't you admit to me that these disciples didn't encounter the risen Christ? They merely had hallucinations. Hmm. And he looked at me and he said, there's no way. I said, what do you mean? He said, Lee, hallucinations are like dreams. They happen in individual minds. You can't wake your spouse up in the middle of the night and say, honey, honey, I'm having a great dream about a vacation in Hawaii. Let's both go back to sleep. We'll have the same dream. We'll save all the airfare. We'll save all the hotel. (laughs) We can't do that. Why? Because dreams happen in individual minds. He said, Lee, you told me that the earliest data that you have about the resurrection says that 500 people saw the risen Christ at the same time. I said, that's right. He said, Lee, 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time would be a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. Mm. And, and then he said, by the way, if, um, if this were a hallucination, then the body would still be in the tomb, right? Oh, wait a minute. The that's tomb's empty. Point. Yeah. 
So, and but could it be something more subtle? Because there is a psychological phenomenon where people want to see something so bad that they convince themselves it's true. So, Peter, can't can't you see him, John? Look, I see him over there in the midst. There he is, and and John, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I see. Him. Could that happen? That's a known psychological phenomenon. The problem, there's lots of problems with that. Number one, the disciples say they talked with them, they ate with them, they touched them. Um, so that was more than just a, a murky vision in the distance. But secondly, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was not primed to have a vision. This, this would run total contrary to everything that had been taught as Jewish believers, that there was one resurrection at the end of time. This half-brother of Jesus, who was a skeptic during Jesus' lifetime, by the way, an embarrassing fact that is probably true because the, they wouldn't have included it if it weren't true because it was embarrassing to them. So he was a skeptic during Jesus' lifetime. He ends up dying as a leader of the church because the resurrection he believed was true. What changed his mind? 1 Corinthians 15, the risen Jesus appeared to him. But he was not as a skeptic, psychologically primed for a vision. And by the way, either was Saul of Tarsus. He's out killing Christians. He hated Christians. He wasn't psychologically primed to have a vision of Jesus being resurrected. Again, totally contrary to Jewish teachings of the day. So I don't think the hallucination or the vision theory stands up to scrutiny. So I got one I'm curious about. If yeah. you were forced to take the position of a skeptic and yeah. discount the resurrection, which argument would you take? In other words, I know you don't buy any of the alternate naturalistic yeah. theories, yeah. but if you were forced to, which one would you throw your hat in or how would you try to dismantle the resurrection? You know, I've, I've looked at so many different objections and I think they, there's good answers to them all. Okay. The, okay. One, the one that I hear sometimes um, that has an emotional appeal is extraordinary claims require okay. extraordinary evidence. Okay. And, and at first blush, you go, yeah, do we really have extraordinary evidence? Because this is an extraordinary claim. And I want to say, well, no, wait a minute. Number one, it's not an extraordinary event if we have good evidence that there's a creator, as we do from cosmology, physics, biochemistry, and genetics. If there's a creator, it's not a resurrection. is just an event that he could certainly do. Secondly, we don't need extraordinary evidence. We just need good evidence. Hmm. We need compelling evidence. We need evidence that's trustworthy. If, if tomorrow NBC News and um, the New York Times um, uh, had an articles on it saying that a spaceship had landed in Washington, D.C., you'd probably say, now that's an extraordinary event that a spaceship would land, but that's not extraordinary evidence, but they're trustworthy sources. Uh, I have trustworthy sources for the information I have. We don't need extraordinary evidence. We just need good evidence. And I believe we do have good evidence. In fact, I would make this further statement that historically speaking, we do have extraordinary evidence. Okay. Because okay. we have got a proliferation of evidence okay. from a variety of sources from the early world that compellingly provide um a reason to believe that the resurrection actually occurred. So you can take that objection on his face and say, yeah, it's an extraordinary event. I got extraordinary evidence for it compared to all of the other events of ancient history for which I have believe, and yet I have lesser evidence. I think it's really interesting that you wouldn't take a particular uh, argument against, say, they went to the wrong tomb or Jesus didn't yeah. die. Those yeah. don't work. You no. take more of a philosophical approach yeah. to dismiss the evidence. I, Gary Habermas has said most criticisms of the resurrection now are not particular alternate theories, but more of a naturalistic or philosophical bias yeah. because the historical evidence is pretty strong. And but, I can't wait. He's writing a 5,000 page <laughs> book on the resurrection. 5,000 pages. Uh, unbelievable. I got one, one last question for yeah. you. What would you say to people who are on the fence, maybe a skeptic who just yeah. says, I I'm, I'm interested, some of this sounds a little bit compelling to me, but maybe they're afraid of re regretting this later on, what their friends would say. What would you say to somebody on, on the fence here who's not quite ready to trust Christ? Yeah. What encouragement would you give to them? You know, I'd say check it out. Do what I did. I was a skeptic too. I can understand that. 
Uh, I think it's healthy to ask questions. I think it's healthy to investigate. I think it's even healthy to have some doubts as long as you allow those doubts or those questions to pers- to propel you toward reasonable answers. So, you know, mm-hmm. Sean, you asked me earlier about what how the evidence has changed. These days, there's so many good resources out there that if you really want to delve into this and get answers to these issues, there's a lot of great resources uh, that you can go to that can help you get resolution of this issue. And then once you okay. do, good juror reaches a verdict. You don't have to know everything to know something. So the evidence does demand a verdict is what I you're like saying it. to go I'm full circle. I'm going to use that. Can I use that? By the way, Lee, I'll, 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 we'll wrap up with this is I wrote a blog some time ago. What are the top books to give a non-Christian? The first one I said is the gospel of John. Yeah. If you're watching this and you're not sure about the evidence. First, read the Gospel of John and just ask, who is this person, Jesus? Why has he turned the world upside down more than anybody who's ever lived? Yeah. And then second, go get a copy of The Case for Christ. Read it with an open mind. Watch the book, uh, watch the movie, Case mm. for Christ. And uh, if you have an open heart and mind, God can do something powerful there. I do have one more for you, and I apologize, but uh, quickly— you have been very outspoken about our program at Biola, our apologetics yeah. program, and just sent students our way. Yeah. Why are you so enthusiastic about the program uh, that we offer at Biola? You know, my own son uh, went to Biola, got two master's degrees, and then went on to get his PhD in theology and is now a professor at the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. My son-in-law got his degree in apologetics, his master's degree at Biola. Uh, so it's uh, in many ways in the family. Um, you know, it's just a top-notch program when you have people like you and uh, J.P. Moreland and so many um, scholars that are credible, that are godly, that, are, that love students, mm-hmm. that love the process of helping people learn and grow, uh, who don't ignore the growth of the heart um, by focusing exclusively on the growth of the mind. That's right. Uh, it's just, it's just a stellar, stellar place to go. And, uh, I'm constantly pointing people in that direction, even though we have our own program now at Colorado Christian university at the Strobel center for evangelism and applied apologetics. Mm. We're all in this together. And, um, I'll continue always to tout the, um, um, Biola university as being uh, a premier place Uh, to learn not just what we believe, but why we believe it. Lee, thanks for saying that and your encouragement. You're truly a team player that wants other people to win. So I want to thank you for coming on and for your time. There's a whole bunch of really kind comments towards your ministry that I won't take the time to read you, but some really, really thoughtful things that people are just grateful for your faithfulness and your good work. Uh, Those of you who tuned in, whether you're a believer, whether you're skeptic, student, parent, grandparent, Thank you for tuning in. Uh, This is brought to you by Biola Apologetics. And if you want to find more of these discussions, push that little subscription button so we can alert you when new videos will be coming out. We have some other interviews coming up that you won't want to miss. God bless you and have a wonderful week.